was raised in a cold, um, rather forlorn city. I mean, it's an elegant city full of cafes and um, beautifully dressed women, Montreal. But I longed for the natural world. And the only way I used to find it was on the street where we lived, there were ants. So I used to take the ants and put them on my body and colonize them on my, on my body. Alongside that, my metaphysical yearning for the natural world grew um, a deep-seated interest in philosophical matters. And I can remember as a child, I was probably five, we used to gather around the dinner table and after dinner we all used to hold a philosophical conversation. I can remember my father saying, how do you know that you're not dreaming a dream that you're not dreaming? And that really captured my imagination. So I guess um, the two major loves of my life, that is in philosophical issues and in the natural world, were born when I was very young. Australia, it was an incredibly crisp, clear, bright September day, spring day. And the first thing I saw, just about the first thing I saw, was a 28 Parrot. And I just about, I just about fell over. I couldn't believe where I was. I'd never seen such clarity of air, and I'd never seen such brightness, and I'd never seen a Parrot in the middle of a city, you know, I just had never seen that. So I really fell in love with Australia. And um, I had been classically trained, so I had a great, sort of in a way, burden of all this intellectual baggage. And it was the marriage of that with the Australian landscape that just sent me right into the lap of environmental ethics. to be there, to really be present, to try as much as possible to be present to where they are. You know, when you're there, you're, it's like a flower that opens up. All your senses become heightened. Your sense of hearing, your ability to smell, and, and every sound you hear, you can process, you can ask what's that, you, you, you can digest it and try to understand it. Whereas when you live in the city, with the rush and the bustle and the hassle of being in a city, you block. You spend a lot of time blocking out things. Whereas in the bush, you open up to receive things. So it really teaches you to be patient, because everything isn't given to you all at once. <laughs> it teaches you to be attentive. You don't want to trip and break your leg. Not when you're you know, 50 kilometers from the nearest track. It, it teaches you to, to have space to receive things, you know, rather than fill things up all the time. It teaches you to breathe more deeply. It shows you that, just like meditation, it shows you the connection between the involuntary and the voluntary. You know, that very important nexus. It teaches you the importance of, um, of boundaries and edges um, because often edges are exactly where there's the there's mo the most creativity or the, the most there's the most dynamism it's an embedded experience it's a bodily experience it's not just an intellectual experience it teaches you probably better to integrate the mind and the body you know and it teaches you the importance of the body, you know, because if you don't take care of your body, you have no place to live, you know. And really, what I came to understand was that the most powerful educator there is, is the natural world. And I think that it's that loving relationship you have, that loving attention you have with the natural world, that um, propels you, doesn't compel you, 
you're drawn to therefore say, ah, oh, yes, you know, I need this to realize who I am, <laughs> to be fully realized. If you look at the profound imbalances between humans and nature in contemporary contemporary world, I think it's partly a result of um, profound insecurity. And I think that if you are insecure, you really need to control and dominate. If you're insecure, you don't want to be dependent, right? You're, you're terrified of dependency, but in fact humans are radically dependent on the natural world for their well-being, right? And that's scary. So enter manipulative technology to try to pretend that in fact we can control things. We can't control, can't control things. I mean we can't even save the environment. I mean that's also a form of hubris or pride, to believe that we can save the environment. We who can hardly, we hardly have minds that are capable of understanding one billionth of the natural world, its complexity and diversity, you know? It's more complex than we know or can know. So, so it's very important to be mindful of that and to try as best you can to maintain an active, curious interest in the natural world, to see how it orders itself. Aboriginal people were masters of this. I mean, if they wanted to collect, say, spinifex seeds, which made very good tucker, which made very good, you know, they would um, grind them and then make a form of, of, of bread or with, they would allow the ants to do the collecting and then they would harvest a little bit of what the ants had collected. So if you observe that ants do all the work in a merry way, you sit in the shade, <laughs> you know, <laughs> get my point. I mean, the more you understand the natural world, the more effective you can be in your action. And, and you know, you make it look simple, you make that action look simple, but in fact, it's got an enormous depth to it because you've been practicing the art of keen observation. So just as a very skillful dancer will make it look easy to leap, you know, and all the hard work's gone. So the more you understand, the easier, the more effective you can be for the minimal amount of action. Ah, oh, that's deeply satisfying. <laughs> you can then spend time singing or dancing or painting or, you know, um, or making love or, you know, creating good food or, you know. I mean, it's, a, it's always a struggle. It's a struggle to master the 24 hours, let alone to so it's not, doesn't, you know, it's not given. It's not a given, but I mean, it's a joy. It's a joyous struggle. Jermaine Greer once said that the struggle that's not joyous is the wrong struggle. True, it's true. Optimism is a state of mind, not a factual thing, but it's an orientation to be hopeful. One must be hopeful. I mean, how dreary would life be if you believed that everything was doomed and, you know, we were all going to die in a horrible way and take, you know, three quarters of creation with us. I mean, that would be a, a terrible vision. And I'm sure that it's the natural world that's going to show us. I'm sure the natural world has all kinds of surprises for humans and their excesses. And I'm sure it's the natural world that's going to show us a few of her tricks. <laughs> you know? Because nature's a trickster, you know? So, um, I think the future's rich with possibilities.